the Dakota Building, New York, New York. It's here that on December 8, 1980, former Beatle John Lennon was fatally wounded by Mark David Chapman, who remained at the scene, calmly reading the book, The Catcher in the Rye. Although made famous by Lennon's assassination, the Dakota Building has a long history of supernatural occurrences and ghostly encounters. Shortly before his death, John Lennon spoke of an apparition he had witnessed, the ghost of a crying lady. The Dakota Building in New York has quite the history. There are many people who believe the place is cursed, but far more lean towards the building just being haunted in the classical sense. Even as early as the 1960s, workers reported seeing the ghost of a woman with blonde hair and old clothing roaming the hallways. Sure enough, the more you dig into New York's Dakota building, the weirder and very creepier things seem to get. But if we look at ghosts themselves in a slightly different way, a whole new meaning or dimension to the Dakota haunting emerges. And not just the Dakota haunting, every haunting, ghosts in general. It is a question that has been asked and debated since the dawn of time. What exactly is a spirit or ghost? Bunker Hill, Los Angeles, California, 1922. May Otis Blackburn and her daughter Ruth create the divine order of the Royal Arms of the Great Eleven, otherwise known as the Blackburn Cult. The mother-daughter duo claimed to hear the direct voices from the angels, Gabriel and Michael. Their claims were that they received these messages directly and that she was asked to write books, books revealing the secrets of heaven and hell, life and death. They in fact claimed that they alone were the two witnesses of the book of Revelation and also that they were destined once their mission was completed, to reveal and open the seventh seal. The Blackburns are thought to be con artists, but recently some people are claiming there was a lot more to their cult than we are led to believe. That what we know of them only scratches the surface of their sinister activities. The concept of a cult is the very definition of unrelenting control of those around you. Nowadays, the term cult has almost become a joke, something to be laughed at or to insult someone. People often jokingly say, what, did you go off and join a cult? But in reality, a cult is no joke, even now. In the later part of the 1960s, the family, led by Charles Manson, was a large group of mostly females who were attracted to the hippie culture of the time and the promise of being the chosen few by their leader. Members of the family eventually became convinced that Charles Manson was the actual manifestation of Jesus Christ and completely believed in Manson's prophecies of Armageddon. They completely believed Manson was actually THE Jesus Christ! Can you imagine the power he must have held over these people for them to actually believe this? I mean, we're not just talking about one or two women. We're talking an entire group of them. Everything I do is always brand new. 
I'm on the premise of reality. I walk a real, a, a real road. The charisma Manson must possess is beyond belief. Just imagine what he could have done if he wasn't a crazy, insane lunatic. Whether or not Charles Manson believed his own stories is up for debate. But one thing is certain, he made others believe them completely. He may have believed some of his own stories at some point, but I doubt he believed everything he taught. I think he just craved more control, more power. The actions performed by members of Manson's cult are horrendous, but his ability to control these people so completely still baffles many. And yet, Manson's gift is not unique. His terrifying power to sway people is far from a gift only he had received. Some believe that the power to brainwash is a gift bestowed to the most troubled of minds, a gift given to those capable of the most disturbing of deeds. There are many witnesses who claim that it was like watching a switch being pushed. Suddenly their friend or acquaintance was loved by everyone. In Sumerian mythology, humans were created as a slave race and certain humans were gifted the ability to control others in order to calm and maintain allegiance. A leader of men controlled by the Sumerian gods so they could maintain order among the slaves. The gods only gifted those they could sense were capable of great evil. These leaders were said to be able to cloud the minds of others, to make them capable of controlling the masses, almost effortless and brutally. According to ancient Sumerian text, the god Enki decides humanity deserves the opportunity to become an enlightened species. He passes down forbidden knowledge against the desires of the other Sumerian gods and thus creates what is arguably the first cult. The Brotherhood of the Snake, in some circles, is considered the first cult in recorded human history. The god Enki passed down forbidden knowledge to a man who was able to control others. And they became his followers, loyal to him and Enki's teachings. According to legend, the gods infiltrated the group and distorted the knowledge, while at the same time infecting their leader with new traits to pass down, vanity and greed. According to legend, the Brotherhood of the Snake ended up splitting into various different cults. All these cults based on lies and misinformation. The descendants of these cult leaders still vie for power today. In this scenario, true cult leaders are born with their gifts, passed down through the ages from their original Sumerian slave masters. Could certain cult leaders not merely have benefited from their likable personalities, but also through a gift passed down by gods? Could people like Charles Manson have actually been cursed with vanity, greed, and even madness built into their very being? There are those who say yes, and aside from self-destruction genetically built into their very being, some believe that certain select cult leaders have been genetically designed to do more than just control other humans. These leaders are meant to actually serve and provide for the old gods. According to most, a ghost is the spirit of a dead person or animal that can be seen by or influence the living. Usually attached to places, people, or objects, a ghost is often seen attempting to right some wrong or trapped within the spiritual plane due to some form of unfinished business. But there are those who claim that we have it all wrong. They claim that ghosts are not what we think they are. There is some debate amongst certain paranormal investigators as to what ghosts actually are. 
and where they come from. These fringe group enthusiasts believe that ghosts are not necessarily the spirits of the dead, but are more like the displaced souls of those who have been possessed by demons. These people believe that when a demon possesses a living person, their soul is pushed out of the body and left to wander the spiritual plane. The ghosts we see are not the spirits of the dead. They are more like displaced souls and who have been forcefully pushed out of their bodies by a demonic force. These ousted spirits are what we, the living, refer to as ghost. There was a case back in the early 80s where, where a home was reportedly haunted by the ghost of a 14-year-old boy. The haunting started gaining media attention, but potential book and movie deal. But almost overnight, the haunting was shown to be a hoax. The boy was, in fact, alive and well, living two states away. The case of the 14-year-old is a strange one. There were so many details and connections uncovered during the investigation that there was no way this haunting could be fake. The ghost boy, Christopher, had so many investigators thinking that they'd finally had the smoking gun. The hard evidence of a life after death. And just like that, it's revealed that there's no way Christopher could be haunting the premises. He's not even dead. The whole ordeal was quickly buried and forgotten. But what if the ghost was really Christopher? There are those who believe that even though Christopher was alive and well, now entering into adulthood, that the reported ghost of his younger self could also be factual. And in fact, young Christopher could still be haunting his old home, even today. Could both scenarios be true? It all depends on what you believe a spirit actually is and where it comes from. We're all told that a ghost is the spirit of a dead person. And yes, a ghost can be just that. But to understand the alternate ghost theory, you first have to believe in possession. Imagine a plane of existence that's home to spirits and demons who all want what we have, life. How do they transition from death to life? Possession. Almost everybody knows what a possession is. A ghost or demonic force enters and inhabits the body of a living person. What often happens next is the battle for the soul of the possessed, or so we're led to believe. But what if there's actually only room for one, one body, one soul? Paranormal researchers contend that yes, even though Christopher is alive and seemingly well, his spirit could be haunting his old residence. But how? If Christopher became under attack by a supernatural force and was ultimately possessed, both stories could definitely be true. But how could the possession of a body result in a separate haunting by the same individual? It's easy to believe that most people who are possessed are somehow saved by a successful exorcism. Many also believe that possessions are actually rare occurrences, but they're not. In 1953, Clarita Villanueva was arrested on charges of vagrancy and prostitution. During her hearing, she was allegedly attacked by not just one entity, but two. After a grueling three-day exorcism, the demons reportedly fled her body, and Clarita was again free. But there are those who have doubts, and records of what happened next are sketchy at best. The case of Clarita Villanueva is a perfect example of the false perception that the good guys always triumph. In Clarita's case, it's never mentioned that after the exorcism, she was like a completely different person. It's been reported that her entire personality from before her possession was changed. She was like a completely different version of herself, 
almost as if she wasn't Clarita at all. And maybe she wasn't. Maybe the pre and post exorcism Clarita were literally two different people. If the exorcism of Clarita Villanueva was in fact not a success, why did any evidence of her possession vanish after the third day? And what, if anything, happened to the consciousness of Clarita herself? What happened to the real Clarita? She was pushed out of her body. She became a ghost. There are thousands of reported hauntings all over the world. And the spirit of Clarita could be one of those thousands. Sure, this all took place in the 50s. But once you become a ghost, time has no meaning. A ghost doesn't know or care if it's 1953 or 2022. This means nothing to a ghost, at least that's what I tend to believe. My name is Harry, and I've been inhabiting this body for 15 years. It's not as strange or unusual as you think. I was originally born in 1763 and clearly remember being possessed by a demon. I remember hearing a voice, but not understanding what it was saying. And then I was floating away from my body. I don't know how much time had passed, but eventually I found a sleeping man and entered his body. I was him. My name was Harry, and the original Harry was gone. Could this all be true? Could there really be spirits and demons forever searching for a body to inhabit so they may live again? And once housed within that new body, could the original soul then become what we would consider a ghost? Forced to haunt the living until either crossing over or taking for themselves a new body. In the 2005 television series, Masters of Horror, the episode titled Cigarette Burns chronicles the search for a mysterious film so horrible it drives its audience murderously insane. For most people, the idea of a cursed film is something that only makes sense within the world of supernatural fiction, reserved for those looking for an interesting plot within a horror movie or series. For others, however, the idea of a cursed object is far from a cliché plot device, and there are a select few who claim to have first-hand experience with such supernatural occurrences. For them, there is nothing fictional when discussing such topics. There are many books and movies involving cursed objects. Cigarette Burns comes to mind, but there are plenty others. The films Ant Rum and Fury of the Demon all deal with similar situations. The concept itself has been around for a very long time. Centuries ago, renowned occultist Dr. John Dee obtained the mysterious Book of Soiga. Reportedly, this book not only contained numerous magical spells and demonic information, but also the names and family trees of actual angels. John Dee must have been completely beside himself when he got his hands on this particular book. The promise of knowledge like this, even potential knowledge, would have been groundbreaking at the time. This was long before the internet, TV, or even radio. Books were the only place to go back then for secret truths. John Dee was said to have been told he would die within two and a half years if he ever attempted to read the Book of Soiga. His statement is definitely one of the reasons that people started referring to this as the book that kills. Were these claims true? Well, there's a reason we still talk about this thing, right? There's a reason that hundreds of years later, the book of Soiga, the book that kills, is still discussed. There are various stories, urban legends, that state owners of the book throughout the ages generally meet their maker within a very short time. The book that kills apparently does just that. After John Dee dies in 1608, the book that kills seemingly vanishes from historical record until 300 years later, when a woman 
Deborah Harkness, rediscovers the book in 1994 and bases a now famous novel turned television show after her experiences. That book, The Discovery of Witches. As for the Soiga curse itself, it seems to have officially fizzled itself out according to some, but for others, they believe that more recent deaths attributed to the Book of Soiga have simply been hidden. A movie that will kill you is a terrifying concept, especially when trying to decide how it actually works. Do you have to watch the whole thing? What happens if you only watch part of the film? Are you still cursed to die? Does it happen instantly or do you go crazy first? It's a really scary concept, but also one that feeds our curiosity. On the other hand, it's not just a person's death that is scary. It's the potential of killing someone else after watching. You dying is one thing, but you being forced to kill someone else is another thing completely. In 2016, a fake documentary premiered that told the tale of an old film that would drive its viewers insane. From filmmaker Fabian Delage, Fury of the Demon, looked into the legitimacy of this reportedly lost, cursed film. Presented as a straight-laced, true-to-life documentary, Fury of the Demon shocked its unsuspecting viewers with the possibility that a movie exists that could drive regular people to perform unspeakable acts. Although Delage's film is actually a fiction, many believe that the story of a repressed, cursed film is actually no fiction at all. In 1864, Edwin Landseer created his painting, Man Proposes, God Disposes. And since then, the painting is said to have been cursed. The story tells of a student writing their exams during the 1920s or 30s, when without warning, he stabbed his own eye out with a pencil. After looking upon the painting, he claimed that the polar bears made him do it the very polar bears depicted in the painting. Now, as an ongoing tradition, the painting is covered up during exam periods. Could this painting really be cursed? Students refusing to sit in front of that painting may sound weird, but we should remember that people usually have a sixth sense about bad things. Man proposes, God disposes simply sounds like a bad omen. It's immediately obvious something is wrong with the painting as soon as you are put in front of it. Although the University of London houses this unusual painting, Landseer's cursed art is not unique. In fact, most museums contain multiple supposedly cursed artifacts generally hidden away from public eyes. The Natural History Museum in London has a cursed amethyst, and the Field Museum in Chicago has a cursed meteorite. Cursed objects are actually pretty common, especially with art. Myths of madness are commonplace. Phoenix, Arizona, 1983. The haunting of young teen Christopher is said to be a hoax. The real Christopher is found to be alive and well. Armed with that knowledge, skeptics are quick to point out that there couldn't possibly be a ghost of a living person. The investigation quickly disappears from the public eye, and the inhabitants of the haunted property are laughed out of spotlight. But not everyone is convinced of a hoax. Witnesses to the haunting are not so quick to dismiss what they've seen and heard, and continue to investigate the haunting in a more private setting. Their findings are shocking and point to a sinister turn of events for both the family of young Christopher and Christopher himself. Most people who enjoy horror movies will probably be familiar with the film Insidious. And that movie, in my opinion, is a great representation of what most ghosts actually are as well as what possession is. The insidious film basically says that spirits and demons actively look for a body to inhabit, to live again. They force the original soul of the person out into the further, 
Then, the demon or spirit that possessed the body gets to live out life within this new vessel. These demons aren't just impersonating the person, but actually become them and living as them. It's entirely possible that the ghost of young Christopher could be haunting his old address, even though his actual body is still physically here. That spirit became Christopher, and the real Christopher became a ghost. Could it be possible that the expelled spirit from a still living body could become the textbook definition of a ghost? Could one such spirit remain tethered to the location where its body was stolen from them? If true, could that mean that even what were thought to be successful exorcisms could actually have been complete failures? How could such definitive decisions ever be made? How could anyone know for sure if the original victim resides within an exorcised body or if the invading spirit remains ready and willing to live out its new life within its new vessel? Most people would never be sure, and it still might not even matter. If the demon possessed an eight-year-old and lived under 70 years in that body, what are you going to do? Put an eight-year-old ghost back into a 78-year-old body? How would that help anyone? According to most believers of the alternate haunting theory, if an expelled spirit isn't restored, within a reasonable amount of time, it could be more damaging to even attempt an exorcism, if such an act is even possible to accomplish. Simi Valley, Southern California. Not long after May Otis Blackburn created the divine order of the royal arms of the Great Eleven, she decided what she called a luxurious retreat, would better serve the needs of the group. The Simi Valley Retreat became the new headquarters, and it's here that the planning of the real monstrosities of the group would take place. Poisonings, a woman being cooked alive in an oven, multiple disappearances, all wrapped in stories of strange rituals and offerings to the angels and even God itself. Publicly, Blackburn ended up being sent to jail for eight counts of grand theft, and then appealed the decision and won. She was actually released from jail, and publicly, her cult was actually disbanded. But was it really? All these things she'd done began being whispered about publicly, and many of the, of the time believed her followers were not only still together, but increasing, all in secret. But what would have nudged Mae Blackburn to take her growing cult and turn it into a secret society? Was Blackburn guided by what we would consider an old god, intent on a more sinister endeavor? Blackburn was released from prison in 1931 and spirited away to Indiana to visit one of her cult leaders who had just given birth. Mae was to perform a ritual on a newborn baby a ritual that was said to channel God into the spirit of the newborn child. Although this is all hearsay and urban legend, and the name of the pregnant woman is never spoken, I can say I was surprised when I found out that the cult leader, Jim Jones, the man responsible for almost 1,000 known deaths, was actually born in Indiana. In 1931. Coincidence? Is this all just a strange happenstance? I don't know. James Warren Jones, the Messiah of the People's Temple, was born in Indiana, 1931, to parents Lynetta Putnam and James Thurman Jones. His mother, Lynetta, was known both for her incredible praises of her son to her equally negative rants thrown at the young Jones. Linetta, on one hand, she was always talking young Jim up and up and up. 
at the same time belittling him. She was also known to have strange religious beliefs and be involved in cults herself. Could it be true that the mother of Jim Jones was somehow also involved with the Blackburn cult? If so, could Mary have had some hand in the creation of Jim Jones's madness? The mother of Jim Jones had dealings with Mae Blackburn and her cult. If true, this adds a really strange wrinkle to the Jim Jones story. Some say the People's Church massacre was destined to happen. The idea that the mother of Jim Jones had dealings with Mayotas Blackburn and together they did something to baby Jim is not only scary but brings us right back to the old gods of Mesopotamia. And the things that Jim Jones ended up doing, just wow. On the surface, the atrocities of the Blackburn cult may be terrifying, but also borderline trivial in nature, especially when compared to other evildoers throughout history. I'm in no way diminishing the horrible things the Blackburn cult are responsible for. But it's the events whispered about secretly that really make May Blackburn. For the record, she thought to be responsible for more than a couple deaths. But under the radar, people believe she may be responsible for hundreds. It's also said that she and her cult regularly sacrificed transient folk and even their own cult members for spiritual and financial gain. Could the homicidal acts of those such as Mae Blackburn have really been orchestrated by some unearthly or demonic entity? And could these cult leaders really have been granted some form of inhuman powers? Power over free will itself? There are those who say yes, and they state that the evidence is everywhere. A 16-year-old girl, Willa Rhodes, was essentially mummified by her parents, buried under some floorboards surrounded by seven dead dogs. May Blackburn convinced the parents that their daughter wasn't actually dead and was simply awaiting resurrection. And after she was discovered by authorities, Blackburn blamed them for Willa's lack of resurrection because they disturbed her. The cult's retreat, Harmony Hamlet, was designed for worship and blood sacrifice. You have to ask yourself, how much of this was all real? And by real, I mean, did any of the Blackburn's actions have any real effect? There are more than a few people who say yes. Harmony Hamlet itself is proof the property was given to her. May Blackburn and her daughter wanted for nothing, and in fact, everything was handed to them. People really believed in their power, or, as some say, they were controlled into subservience. The lucky ones were compelled to give. The not-so-lucky ones were compelled to perform heinous acts. She was known as Queen May, or also as the Heel of God, and she ruled with an iron fist. People who crossed her had a habit of disappearing. It's speculated many unknowns were sacrificed. It's also worth mentioning that Blackburn's retreat was only a few miles from a certain movie ranch that eventually became home for Charles Manson and his cult. Only a few miles. Is that a coincidence? Some have speculated that the entire area surrounding Harmony Hamlet is actually sacred ground of sorts. For certain gods of old, a perfect places to start a cult. You got the Blackburn cult, you got the Manson family, and a few dozen smaller cult-like groups, all in and around Death Valley area. If you want to start a working cult, Death Valley would fit the bill perfectly. Perfectly! During the early 1900s, New Age religious and spiritual groups were all the rage. Although they were not called cults at the time, the two terms are almost impossible to separate. Many today believe that even worldwide religions should be considered cults. The similarities between religious and cult-like groups are hard to ignore. In modern times, Google has become the digital go-to for nearly every information-seeking person on Earth. 
However, when it comes to the supernatural and curses, the urban legends are often shown as prevalently as any fact-based results. This is especially true for those who often indulge their fantastical ways of thinking. It is known as the Google search bubble. Everyone knows that Google records everything you do. All this information is actually used to shape your search results. It's curious that when searching for new information, Google relies on its previous information about you to shape its results, giving you what it thinks you want to see instead of anything new. If you're looking for information about the legitimacy of a cursed object, Google will take all of your past searches and website visits and give you the results it thinks you want. If you enjoy fringe conspiracy theories, that's what Google will show you. It will totally skip over any legitimate facts or studies relating to the object you are researching. See, now this is the problem with modern research, specifically doing online research. You're not actually doing research. You're feeding the intellectual frenzy of what you already believe or want to believe. There's only one way to combat this rigged game and that's to do offline research, libraries, archives, door-to-door -door conversations. To find the real truth, you need to unplug yourself and do some old school sleuthing. This doesn't just go for paranormal research, but all research. The internet has spoiled us. It's not giving us the true facts. Long ago, the Tuscarora people, a Native American tribe, migrated to the area of Roanoke, where they encountered groups of European explorers and in some circles have become synonymous with the Roanoke mystery. As the story goes, in 1587, 118 people attempted to settle on Roanoke Island, and within three years, they had vanished without a trace. All that has ever been found of that colony was one word, Croatoan. 118 people, no trace of them or their settlement, just wiped completely from existence. Nowadays, most of us don't really appreciate the scale of 100 plus people, but that's a pretty massive group of humans to simply vanish. No signs of attacks, no signs of sickness. The actual buildings and storage barns were all just gone. There was no sign anyone had ever been there. Had there been the remains of buildings, bodies, any indication at all that something bad had happened there, we wouldn't be talking about this mystery hundreds of years later. That's a fact. Within more quieted circles of conversation, spoken secret by some of the Tuscarora people, something far more sinister than a simple disappearance occurred at Roanoke Colony. Something that may have involved a secret relic. There are rumors that the Croatone tribe may have in fact been named after a mysterious artifact they had come into possession of in the distant past. This relic, if it even existed, has seemingly been long lost to history, but its power is said to have been harvested from the very king of all evil spirits. Some people believe that the word left behind, Croatone, is actually a reference not to the people, but to an artifact, an evil artifact. According to some, the Croatone relic contained an inscription or glyph that was capable of driving those who see it murderously insane. Certain native tribes tell stories of an ancient relic that had the power of madness trapped within its sacred prison. No trace of this relic has ever been found and its story is mainly told orally. In modern times, the story is secretly whispered between a select few. The supposed Croatone artifact is interesting because some believe it actually has turned up in modern times, despite most people thinking it has been lost to history. Some say its likeness has been copied and used in modern times. And here's the thing, supposedly the glyph symbol that is on the Croatone relic itself has the power to drive people crazy. You don't need the actual artifact to drive people insane, you just need a representation of the image it held. I mean, this is a truly scary thought. 
Could it be true that the inscription on an ancient relic held the power to drive men insane? Could it also be true that perhaps even scarier, the relic itself isn't even needed, only the representation of the glyph it contained? I think that the thought of an old film that can drive its viewers crazy makes for an excellent scary story. Anyone who enjoys a good horror flick would love it. I know I'd go out to see it. One of the great modern writers of things that could make you go insane was author H.P. Lovecraft, who wrote of forbidden knowledge and cursed things beyond our perceptions. Lovecraft was the author of some very strange stuff. Stuff that would drive people to madness, forbidden information and imagery, all the things that lurk in the darkness, the unseen world. The writings of Lovecraft is still used heavily today within the filmmaker community. Even greats like Stephen King frequently use Lovecraftian concepts in their works, but some say that Lovecraft didn't necessarily dream up his horrific concepts, rather that they were handed down to him in some way. The Absolute End of the World is a fictitious lost film in the episode Cigarette Burns from the series Masters of Horror. Watching this fictitious movie would drive you insane. And because of that, it was a highly prized collectible piece by those interested in the occult. But there are those who say a real life version of this movie exists. It is called The Silver Curse. The Silver Curse is not the actual name of the film. This cursed film was never actually given a name. The term Silver Curse comes from the fact that it was shown on the silver screen. Now, depending on who you ask, it's kept locked away in the Vatican vaults, away from the public eye. According to whispers, the Silver Curse was privately screened twice, and only seven people have actually seen it. Two of those people died while watching. It's said that the filmmaker invited two of its friends to watch the film. The priest, Elton Christopher Leach, agreed in order to support his friend and give his opinion. But as the story goes, Elton was more interested in reading his Bible by candlelight than actually watching. According to legend, although not fully paying attention, Elton began feeling anxious and extremely angry. It wasn't long after that the third person let out a scream, took out a pocket knife and began stabbing himself. The film was stopped and once Elton regained control of himself, he realized his filmmaker friend was gone, never to be seen again. Elton brought the film to the attention of the church, who decided to screen it again to verify its authenticity. A special blind was set up so the projectionist could watch the people but not see the movie itself. The resulting second screening was disastrous, and one of the viewers slit their own throat. But as the projectionist ran for help, he got a look at the movie theater screen. The film had stopped, but the still image was still being projected. What the operator saw, he described as an ancient looking stone with a strange glyph carved into it. It's an image that sounds frighteningly like the Croatoan relic that is thought lost to history. It's interesting to speculate about the Croatoan image being used within the film and what the results would be. Could the Vatican secret archive really contain the mysterious Silver Curse film reel? If so, we may never find out if it contained the Croatoan image or not. After the first screening of the film, the filmmaker was never seen again. Had he known of the dire consequences his movie would place on its viewers? Coincidentally, there are those who say a second print of the film was made, although it has never turned up. Or has it? The Amazon Jungle, 1925. Renowned adventurer Percy Fawcett leads a team for a third attempt to find the lost city of Z. He was never seen again, and to this day, what happened to the expedition remains a hotly debated mystery. 
but there are those who believe that what Fawcett was actually searching for was something much more sinister than a mysterious city lost to the jungle. It's been whispered that Perry Fawcett was actually searching for an ancient native Indian relic. One that ended up being hidden deep within the Amazon and that would cause insanity in those who see it. Could this be the Croatoan artifact? There is supposed to be a link between the director of the Silver Curse film and various tribes of the Amazon. Some say this is where the director vanished to. Could it be true that the original Croatoan relic now resides somewhere in the Amazon? And that its image was used purposefully in a film in order to see the results? There are those who say yes, but we may never know for sure. I know some people say that Percy Fawcett had sent the relic back with one of the letters to his family. And then because he stole the relic, he was murdered by its guardian tribe. I've also heard the relic drove him mad and he killed the people of his expedition. Do I believe any of it? Not really. Could the connection between the Croatoan relic and Percy Fawcett be a complete fiction? And if it is, does that mean that the Silver Curse Reel is also make-believe? The problem with this story is that there is no proof, none at all. We don't even have any real accounts of the film itself, or even a theater, only stories. And yet, there are connections! There are clear points of reference! But do I think the whole thing is just a scary story? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. If a film exists, such as the mysterious Silver Curse Reel, what does that tell us about the unspoken truth of humanity? Could we really be driven to madness simply from looking at an image or object? It is interesting. And yes, very scary. The thought of a movie that can make you kill people is nuts. Great horror is great horror. And with titles such as cigarette burns and ant rum gracing our screens, there's no question stories like that of the Silver Curse will continue to circulate. Could any of these stories actually be real? I think so, even if the way they actually happen is not the same as the urban legends. There are lots of documented cases of cursed things. Books, tablets, statues, places. So why not celluloid? As much as we learn and understand our world, there's still so much we don't know. So much we don't understand. I often hear how fragile a human mind can be. Depression, brainwashing, so the thought of a movie that can stir emotions isn't a hard concept to understand. Isn't that what every director wants? An emotional reaction, a response? People get excited or sad watching movies all the time. That's the point of most films. But is it really possible that a movie could elicit such a strong reaction in a person? a reaction that could drive a person to harm themselves or others? The truth of the matter is, there's some really interesting and incredible stories being told about cursed objects and the supernatural in general. I'll admit that I do often wonder if such a film could exist. But I also remember that many of these stories came from a different era, a different century, a time of incredible superstition and beliefs. I mean, think about how many things we know today that were thought ridiculous a hundred years ago. I always try to keep an open mind when I hear these stories. American Fork, Utah, July 24th, 1984. Brenda Laverty is found dead in her home, along with her 15-month-old daughter, Erica, it was quickly found that Ronald Lafferty was behind the heinous murders of his family members. 
it was also revealed that Ron had been instructed to do so by the Word of God. Along with once being a city councilman, Ronald was also a high-ranking member within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As his religious beliefs became more and more twisted, he was excommunicated. That, however, didn't stop this cult-like leader from preaching. This church leader killed two people, one of them a baby, that we know about. After an exhaustive investigation, it was determined that Lafferty was nothing more than an egotistical madman, a man who had grown spiteful over his lack of control. Ron claimed that God told him he needed to kill his enemies. He needed to kill those responsible for his excommunication from the church. God told him to do this. This man was in the upper echelons of the church. How much did they cover up before finally giving him the boot? Before the murders, Lafferty formed a cult known as the School of the Prophets, where he claimed to receive holy messages. It said that Lafferty received one such message to kill his ex-wife and daughter because she had once been the bride of Satan. What isn't often spoken of is that Ronald received this message while holding a pendant cross, said to have been owned by Mae Blackburn. He had power over so many people, although not often spoken about. It's said he regularly held on to an old strange cross. Those close to him claimed it had not only belonged to Mae Blackburn, but that she had it commissioned. Is it possible that Ronald Lafferty had come to own a pendant created by Mae Blackburn herself? A pendant that contained strange powers that allowed him to ascend the ranks of his church there are some who say yes, and that this pendant was also responsible for the deterioration of Lafferty's sanity and his eventual murderous behavior. You have to ask yourself, if Ronald eventually killed members of his own family, who else did he kill? Or have killed before that? And although never confirmed, what's with the story of the Blackburn Cross? That's a random thing to just materialize out of thin air. The idea of the cross must have come from somewhere. It's just too random a thing to be completely made up. We'll never know for sure of this Blackburn connection, but if true, would I be surprised? Not at all. For as long as he could remember, Arthur Flowerdew was haunted by memories of another life, a life long ago in an ancient city surrounded by desert. As he grew older, many memories faded but not of the city itself. One day, while watching an archaeology documentary on the BBC, he saw the ancient city of Petra, the same city from his memories, and he knew things he possibly couldn't have known, including details of areas not yet excavated. Most people think Arthur Flowerdew is a reincarnation of someone else, but wonder if he isn't. It's possible that while young, the real Arthur was possessed by an older spirit from a time when Petra was an active city. Of course, the invading spirit would have the memories of its past life and carry them into its new body. It could even forget that it had invaded another body. Could it be true that what many consider to be instances of reincarnation or past life experiences actually be evidence that that particular individual had at some point been possessed by another spirit or demon? What happened to the original spirit who resided within the possessed body? Could it have eventually made its way to what we consider the other side? Or would it remain within the spectral plane, becoming what we would consider a ghost? It's an interesting concept that have many paranormal researchers scratching their heads. This alternate ghost theory would suggest that most hauntings are not due to unfinished business or angry victims of some heinous crime, 
it would suggest that the majority of apparitions were innocent victims, robbed of the chance to remain among the living. Okay. At what point does an invading spirit earn the right to be within its host? Does that point ever even come? If a displaced spirit takes over the body of a five-year-old child, when does it legitimately become that person? A year? 50 years? Even if the victim is 40 years old and is possessed, how long until it doesn't even matter? Exercising someone who has been possessed long term could result in the body becoming a vegetable. The original spirit has long since crossed over. There's nothing left to return. It's a twisted wheel of life. And who says the original ousted spirit hasn't already possessed another body? It's an interesting scenario to consider. If a body is possessed by an invading spirit, who's to say? An exorcism would be of any help at all. Unless an exorcism is performed quickly, who's to say the original spirit hasn't already crossed over, or perhaps already possessed a new body? It's just as possible that a successful exorcism could end up leaving the body empty, unresponsive, no brain activity, or dead. London, Ontario, 2002. When a normally shy 19-year-old boy was suspected of being possessed, his parents, with the help of a friend from their congregation, began an exorcism to rid their son of the alleged demon within him. Part of the exorcism included confining the man to a metal chair in the basement. The young man eventually died of dehydration, and the parents, along with their friend, were convicted. This incredible story is by no means an isolated event, and it forces many to ask a tough question. Should an exorcism ever be considered? There are many who believe that those who want to perform an exorcism may, themselves, have ulterior motives. If the true nature of the universe includes genuine possession in its grand scheme, who are we to mess with nature? Imagine this, if you will, that all the souls roaming the spectral plane and those who have crossed over are actually meant to possess a living body. Imagine that possession is the way in which the human race continues on. Imagine for a moment that that's how it's meant to be, what nature intended. Could it be possible that possession by an exterior force is not only common, but normal? Could possession be even considered as a required ritual? This idea brings us suspiciously close to the theory of reincarnation. Only with this idea, every person on Earth has lived within an uncountable number of previous hosts. The uniqueness of a reincarnated individual would actually be the anti-truth. We would all be victims of possession in one way or another. Many Native American cultures tell us that we all descend from our previous ancestors, all the way back to the beginning. The beliefs are all fundamentally the same. There are also many beliefs that elder spirits are present to guide us, that these spirits have remained to watch over us. Could such elder spirits be intentionally stopping themselves from crossing over in order to possess the living and then release them as needed? They summon the elder spirits for guidance, inviting them into their own body for a sh short period of time. This is possession! That would mean that these ghosts are hanging around on purpose, waiting to be asked into a living body. If this can be true, so could the so-called alternate ghost theory. It's all very interesting how everything wraps back around. Reincarnation, spirits, demons, past life experiences, hauntings. It all feels like different individual parts of the same phenomenon. The possession of the living could be as normal as breathing. That's not to say that occasionally an evil element isn't present. Could it really be true? Could the ghosts we report and the hauntings we experience 
simply be from souls who have refused, or are unable to, cross over and resume the natural cycle of life? Could we all be the victims of a spiritual possession that, in fact, has made us the people we are today? Could a ghost, at some point, simply decide they are ready to either start over or attempt to live in a life already in progress? It seems to me that for the most part, this alternate ghost theory basically says that every new life comes from another, which sort of makes sense. If you believe that the soul is simply pure living energy, well, we know that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. That may explain a haunting or a ghost if you believe in that kind of thing. The basics of this idea are simple. You can have the ghost of a 19th century 20 year old man haunting an old bridge at the end of your street and then find out that the actual man ended up living into his 70s because he had been possessed by another spirit and lived out its life. Well, maybe it's not actually that simple at all, but does that make it wrong? No, not at all. There are many theories that surround the existence of ghosts or an afterlife just as there will ever only be one way to find out the truth for sure. Unfortunately, when the true answer is finally revealed, we won't be able to share that knowledge with the living. Or will we?